In this episode, I introduce you to the wonderful best-selling author, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and minimalist, Sarah Wilson. She is kind of the epitome of everything that we can relate to in terms of trying to achieve so much, trying to make a meaningful life, while also just trying to get life right and make a difference in the world and we really dive into all of those concepts in this episode Sarah openly shares her family life what it was like for her growing up and as well this state of despair and disconnectedness that we all find ourselves in in the world at this time feeling disconnected from nature feeling like the world is getting worse and we're not addressing the climate crisis, we talk about what is there to hope for and finding hope in all of this. This is a deep, beautiful episode. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed recording it with her. Okay, let's go to the show. Okay, Sarah Wilson, I'm so excited to chat to you today. You have been quite an inspiration to me. I think um, not just with First We Make the Beast Beautiful, that gorgeous book that you wrote about your experience with anxiety and navigating this whole journey, but also the way that you, I think it was just when I was getting into health and wellness and learning about all that stuff that you were exploding on the scene with I Quit Sugar as well. So It's my absolute pleasure to have you here today and be chatting to you. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. So I want to start, and and this is just a general question, just to open us up where I start with most people. Just the first thing that comes to mind, what do you wish more women knew? Oh, God. Um, I wish more women knew, more humans knew that there is no guidebook to life um, and that no one got it. We've got this idea that, you know, everyone was handed a sort of a guidebook. Everyone sort of, everyone except for us was born with an idea of what life is meant to be about. And um, I just wish that everybody knew maybe earlier um, that that's not the case. Therefore, there's incredible freedom to explore things on your own terms and working to a moral compass, you know, uh, rather than to sort of ridiculous ideas that society sort of dictates. So, yeah, that'd prob- that would probably it. Although I will clarify or qualify that, um, of course, working that out as you get older, working out that nobody got the guidebook, that there's no one perfect way to live life is actually a journey you've got to go through yourself. And in fact, that journey is probably one of the most important journeys you can do. So Mm -hmm. perhaps I wouldn't want to give that secret away. (laughs) Uh, Maybe, maybe I would just like to uh, encourage people to do that journey. Yes, that's gorgeous. And that, is what your new book is all about as well. And I want to talk about that um, as we, as we go through, but I, I, I feel what you're touching on there is this idea, this made up concept that there is normal, like there's a normal way to live that we're all meant to be living. And yeah, it's just not true. No, that it's not at all. And unfortunately it's a, it's a concept that contemporary society works to, um, you know, so much of the way that we live is about sort of a, it's a sort of a prescribed cookie cutter conveyor belt notion of life. And Mm. it's become more and more prescribed as history or humanity has progressed forward and technology, of course, um, you know, funnels, you know, normalcy into sort of the one pool uh, with a lot more um, accuracy than, you know, than past eras but um yeah it is something that um I feel that at the moment we're very much suffering from an idea that there's one way of doing things um you know we're a society that's not used to gray everything's black and white you know and um it's causing all kinds of problems as we know in 2020 yeah yeah and I think when we have a bar set of what what is normal or that you know the 
where we need to be, what, what part of our life we need to be at at a certain age, all these things, it gives us just more of a canvas to decide where we, there's a problem with us. There's something wrong with you because you're not fitting into that. Yeah. And particularly around anxiety, which of course is the subject of your podcast. Mm. Um, you know, a, a lot of people were really surprised when they read in my book that anxiety only entered um, the DSM, the means of diagnostic tool that's used in the Western world for psychiatry um, in 1980. So, it, wow. and it was sort of about 12 months after the first anti-anxiety medication was invented. I mean, you know, is that a coincidence? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's, it's something that uh, we've come to sort of, our generation has come to kind of accept that, you know, that anxiety is a disorder, that it's a problem. Now, that's not to say that people before us, you know, our grandparents, our great grandparents didn't have anxiety. Of course they did. But it was considered one of many emotions and important emotions, you know. Um, of course, humans have always suffered from flight or fight. That is our survival mechanism. Anxiety is a survival mechanism. We've turned it into a disorder and in part because we've medicalized it and we've provided a drug. So that then means, you know, it's sort of treated like other medical conditions, which can be helpful. I agree. But um, what it's also done is actually uh, made the whole idea of discomfort extreme emotion, extreme flight or fight sensation, we've, we've kind of made those things stigmatized. We've, we've created a culture where we're not used to sitting in that discomfort. We've sort of made discomfort wrong, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it, I often talk about the fact that we don't have an epidemic of anxiety. We have an epidemic of a lack of resilience. Mm. You know, we don't have a dialogue around both discomfort but also around difference the fact that yeah some of us are literally born more intense with deeper thoughts deeper emotions a desire to, to you know pick the scab off wounds and ensure that we know what's underneath them you know and um and and that's not nurtured it's not celebrated it's not accepted as it was in the past and it was in the past um you know throughout history the bulk of wartime and emergency leaders were bipolar for instance so Winston Churchill and you know there's been American presidents that suffered from um, by what's now called bipolar disorder um, the bulk of poets inventors artists musicians and when I say the bulk I'm talking 70% plus had some kind of intense anxious disorder, um, predominantly bipolar or obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no and that's just... No yeah, doubt Adolf Hitler would have had something as well. Well, I think he had a personality disorder, which is very different to an anxious disorder. So mm -hmm. I think that there's fair, a fair bit of consensus that he had narcissistic personality disorder or borderline personality disorder. I think there's a fair bit of just discourse around that. So yeah. it is a slightly different category. Um, but which is not to say that there weren't sort of despotic leaders that were also bipolar and anxious, you know, it didn't necessarily produce goodness in all directions. But the point is, um, you know, even, even there's quite a lot of uh, evidence that when people go back and look through uh, the history books and look at shaman, you know, and various community leaders in ancient cultures, um, they possess what we would now call bipolar symptoms, you know, or display bipolar behaviour or obsessive compulsive behaviour. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember from First We Make the Beast Beautiful, but I refer to um, some studies by, done by Diane Fossey, um, who was sort of a, a, she worked a lot with chimps, you know, and mm -hmm. she did some studies that looked at um, chimps and how there was always a sort of a small percentage, roughly the same percentage that exists in human populations, about 1.4% who displayed qualities we'd describe as obsessive compulsive. So, you know, they, they stayed awake all night. They had really attentive hearing sensitivities. They worried, they fretted, et cetera, et cetera. And um, they sat on the outside of the group. They're often ostracized. They are often sort of, um, you know, kept to themselves. And as I say, stayed awake all night. Now she removed those 
particular chimps from the, the clan or the tribe or whatever you call it. And um, in all cases, the tribe uh, failed to, it just dissipated, disintegrated within six, six months. So they failed to survive. And her point was that it's this 1.5% that exists in sort of for evolutionary reasons to protect us. So, you know, um, people have obsessive compulsive disorder. We have this kind of evolutionary chink, you know, this sort of quirk in our makeup that ensures a percentage of humans have these high standards of safety and hygiene. And so it's always, you know, these, these so-called disorders that we now see as highly problematic and need to be eradicated with medication, um, they've served purposes throughout history. And, and so that's always been the thing I've wanted to explore. Oh my gosh. And that's just so like all of the, that we, you just said, just spoke to my soul, Sarah, because firstly, it's this, it's this sense of the, the amount of women I speak to who say, I, I don't think I'm really like, I don't think I really have a problem with anxiety. I haven't been diagnosed. I haven't like, you need a diagnosis to get support or reach out for, you know, and, and sort of, yeah, like have someone help you a little bit with this. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. It, and then to be kind of seeing this idea that maybe this isn't a problem we need to fix as such and more just the different varieties of human expression of human life that we see. Yeah. I mean, my entire career has been dedicated to having a better conversation and asking more beautiful questions of life rather than the obvious sort of limited one. So yeah, I, I'm not saying that anxiety isn't hard and I'm not saying that some people certainly suffer it in, in more extreme ways than others. And mm -hmm. I'm certainly not saying that we shouldn't be there to help and support those in pain. Um, but it, it, it should be a support that that isn't about eradicating how they're feeling, but basically in many ways, celebrating it, saying, Hey, good on you for feeling this way. You care. I mean, that's something that I talk about a fair bit in first we make the beast beautiful. Um, one thing that often is forgotten that anxious people have this in common. We care, we care big time. And I think I, I have a, like a little two page um, section where I go, all right, let's pause for a moment and discuss all the wonderful reasons why it's great to have an anxious person in your life. And I sort of tick off these things like we are the people that will remember when we have a picnic that, you know, little Charlie has a gluten intolerance and so-and-so, you know, can't eat fish and, oh, and we have a weather contingency plan and we've, you know, like that is the way our brains work you know yes we'll kind of have a fitful fit you know when when things get too much but equally we will also be the ones that notice when somebody's having a rough time or has a need that needs to be met um and you know i sort of we basically as i say we give a shit about everything and so when we're discussing you know when we're talking or comforting somebody who's anxious that's almost what I feel is the first thing we should be covering off. Okay, let's firstly establish you give a shit. You really, really care. Thank you. Okay, that's gone a little bit too far in this instance and you've got upset. So let's talk about it from through this framework rather than, hey, what are we going to do to stop you feeling like this? You know? Yes. It's like we are the meerkats that are just like looking out for the rest of the group. Yeah. And we are going to get them, survive, like keep them surviving. And yes, or the canary down the minefield as well. That's the other role that um, anxious people play because a lot of people with anxiety, and I'm sure many people listening to this will relate, we have very sensitive senses of smell and hearing. Of course, of course that keeps us awake all night because we can hear, you know, when, when somebody's snoring three streets away. Um, and so we are like the canary down the minefield. We will know when... Um, something's poisonous or dangerous. That's kind of our role in, mm. in, in sort of the human world. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I was going to ask you, you know, what is it that you believe set that book apart for you? And I, I think you've already answered it. It's the, it's, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but it's definitely yeah. just asking these different questions and seeing this through a different lens. Like if we have one superpower as human beings, it is that we get to make meaning out of 
whatever we want through whatever yes. perspective we want. Yeah. And we are meaning making machines. That's mm. kind of what we do. And, and, um, you know, the process of creating meaning takes us to dark places and, you know, absolutely. I mean, yes, the, 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 the premise of my book is to reframe um, anxiety through a philosophical and a, a spiritual lens, as opposed to a, a mere, mere sort of medical lens. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we, we do, um, it, 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 anxiety becomes something that has meaning. Yes. Yes. And I, I always say with, with the work that I do, it's like there, there is a message in your anxiety. It's, it's often guiding you towards understanding things about yourself. Um, looking at, you know, some, some things that are going on in your life. Um, it's not necessarily something we need to demonize and just like not feel at all. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it actually becomes a far better modulating mechanism. And I prefer to use the word modulating as opposed to moderate, you know, um, as to, you know, was it managing? You know, we often talk yeah. about managing yeah. anxiety. I prefer to talk about modulating. It's about mm. dialing it down just so that it, we, can, it, we can experience the meaningfulness of it, but it doesn't actually um, stop us from uh, living a meaningful life, you know? So, um, yeah, that's, yeah. I think modulating is a far better word. Yes. I like that. I really like that. So look, Sarah, you have had this incredibly successful career. You had the I quit sugar empire. Um, you were the editor of, of cosmopolitan in Australia. Um, you've obviously published amazing books. Um, and you started, I read somewhere you started your first business when you were 12 years old. I'm, just, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, where do you believe that the fire to do so much has, has come from in your life? Oh, oh, look, from my angst, from the discord, from the, from the friction that my anxiety has created in me. I mean, I was anxious as a very young child and, you know, every photo of me is kind of, St either staring out into space with a look of just oh, um, perplexed, um, stunning, you know, sort of um, wonder um, or frowning in kind of worry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I remember my father was always trying to get me to smile in photos and, you know, which of course just made me glare even more. But um, yeah, I, I think, um, look, I can't say that it came from my parents. They weren't particularly entrepreneurial. They really don't know where it came from. In fact, it kind of annoyed them a little because I was always dream. you know, they'd go, uh oh, Sarah's bored. Um, <laughs> and um, that was kind of code like, uh oh, Sarah is churning. Sarah's got stuff that, you know, I, I suppose my parents today with what they know today and of course they were very young when they had me and it was a very different era um they i think today they would probably identify oh here we go sarah's churning sarah's asking deep questions um you know what's going to come you know so yeah. for me um i think i i just look for me quite a lot of my modulating of my anxiety and my understanding of anxiety has come through driving it into purposefulness. Now that hasn't, that's kind of been almost a healthy addiction, but still it's a little bit of an addiction. Yeah. Um, I haven't quite worked out. I'm 46 now. I haven't quite worked out if it's a good thing at all the time or whether sometimes it can be, you know, a bit of escapism, but mm. yeah, when I, when I, when I feel this surge of energy and, and anxiety, um, I will often try to steer it into productivity. Um, and, you know, look, it, outwardly, it makes me a very functioning bipolar person, you know, or, or whatever it is, whatever label I'm being slapped with at the time. But yeah, as a 12 year old, I lived in the country. Um, I was um, frustrated. There were not that many um sort of uh, exciting stimulating things happening around me you know there was kangaroos and lots of brothers and sisters and a dried up dam and um yeah my brothers always refer to the fact that you know uh yes I was the eldest you know I was their big sister they sort of say oh yeah we were mucking around and, and Sarah was 
looking out over the horizon, dreaming of bigger things. <laughs> and I think that was probably what was going on. But um, yeah. yeah, so I just, um, I don't know, like I got given some sort of this FEMO modelling clay for Christmas and I certainly wasn't going to just sort of muck around with it. I thought, all right, let's make some stuff. So I made this jewellery and used to sell it in galleries in Canberra. You know, mum used to take me in about once a month and I'd drop my gear off, pick up my cash and head back out, you know. And I painted library bags. So I'd make these, I bought a big roll of calico with my my birthday money and um, made these library bags and painted them with all these motifs on them. Um, and I wasn't particularly great at art, you know, um, but I just managed to find a way to do it. You know, I think my grandmother gave me fabric paints for Christmas. So, and uh, I, I made quite the fortune. <laughs> um, I bought Crazy. the family's first television. Yeah. Um, or oh. first color television. Um, so um, yeah, that was, you know, mum and dad used to call me money bags because, you know, anyone who wanted a loan, I had the money um, and sort of, yeah, it, I, I suppose it was a way of funneling my energy, my drive, my dreams, my, look, I mean, as you'd know from reading the book, I talk about the fact, and it's not my idea, obviously it's been um, developed and considered by philosophers for many, many, you know, decades or centuries, um, the anxiety is very much a a sort of a projection into the future so it's a it's an angst about what is to come and depression on the other hand is a sort of lament for things past so it's a very past orientated mood um, and of course the salve for both is to exist in the present as much as possible but with you know I'm very very predominantly anxious I do suffer from depression or have done especially when I was younger but mm. it's a projection a f kind of like a surge forward and so for me at 12 I just wanted to be productive older and and doing stuff in the future you know creating and seeing what could happen and um, I've been fortunate I suppose that I'm a very reserved awkward um, person However, my bipolar has enabled me, like it just thrusts me out into the realm of risk. It takes me to an edge, even if I'm not aware of it. I sort of reflect back on it, you know, 12 months after I've done something and go, what on earth got me to do that? Like, and you know, people who've known me have gone, you of all people, how did you manage to go and sit for an audition for, a, you know, a Panasonic commercial? you know, when you won't even stand up in front of people, you know? Um, oh. And it's, it, it has been my bipolar, this the great surge forward, as I call it. Oh my gosh. And this, I think is quite, I think what can be interesting in this whole, whole area is there's, there's a part of us, like you were saying, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And it's like, well, I mean, we can make it mean whatever we want it to mean, but there's like a part a part of this we we like about ourselves, you know, as someone who relates to the, especially that high functioning anxiety and achieve, achieve, achieve and do, do, do. Um, it's like, I, I know I like that part of myself as well, but it's just kind of modulating it, grabbing it at that point where it's like, hold on, we're like, we're burning the candle at both ends. Yeah. Need to just pull back a little bit. Yeah. And finding some kind of a, you know, balance in it. Um, but it's not about throwing it away altogether and kind of dismissing it and saying, we don't want to be that at all. No. And in, in first you make the beast beautiful. I talk about when you've got a mental disorder, quote unquote, it's, it comes with a responsibility and the responsibility is a bit like being charged with carrying around a shallow bowl of water for the rest of your life. Mm. And you've got to remain steady. And so our job is to is to keep sort of physically and mentally steady and you know having practices like meditation and eating good food and getting to bed at a, a sensible hour it's kind of our job because otherwise we get wobbly and yeah. the extremes take hold and you know um, bipolar you know takes us to extremes as it is but it can be manageable if 
um, you keep yourself on track if you keep yourself relatively grounded. And so, um, yeah, if it gets wobbly, um, you start to sort of, you know, the dish starts to sway, the water starts sloshing, and then it starts sloshing over the edge and you become completely depleted and you spend your life, just to extend this metaphor, mm. having to return to the source, filling back up again and then setting off once more over the same ground, to catch up to where you are at. And, you know, your loved ones are now covered in water and they're kind of fed up with it, you know? Mm. So um, I know it sounds like an odd metaphor, but I keep it in mind myself. It's, it's a job I have. It, yeah. You know, I have um, great passions that come from my condition, but equally, um, I have, there's responsibility that comes with it. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Um, And so one thing I'm just so curious about, about your journey is when you had, you've obviously experienced so much success. Did you ever reach a point where you really felt I am successful? I've reached the top of the peak. Oh God, no, I don't think I ever will. I mean, it depends on what you classify as successful Mm -hmm. um i suppose mm, um yeah i I, yeah i get i do get asked that question a little bit actually um you know i'm sort of often told and you might get the same and maybe other people listening um i get told to or you know that people say well why don't you why don't you just enjoy your success for a bit you know do you ever sit back and go and just revel in it a bit now and i just don't and not because I'm a martyr. It's just like, um, it's, it, it's, it, it's the process that I enjoy. So it's the process that I'm engaged in. Um, and, and the completion of it is kind of just the signal for me to move on to something else. Um, so, um, no, success for me is, um, it's an ongoing thing. It's emotion. It's, yeah. um, it's, and, Um, yeah, I suppose as I've got older, I have found comfort in this. And that to me is a wonderful success that I actually do find comfort in what I do as opposed to sheer terror. Um, and that's probably more of a sign of success for me is actually understanding how and why I do things and kind of being cool with it you know going all right this is this is just the way I do things now um yeah but I I don't think I'll ever I'll ever sort of stop and I I don't aim for success um I see a gap and that's where I go I just want to explore it and I think that the I mean a big part of this is like if you were to just sit back and chill out for I don't know a year or more you you probably could but um it would be not fulfilling that sense of purpose for you. That's right. I thought you were about to say you could chill out for about an hour. Um, <laughs> and I might, like, yeah, maybe I could. Um, I'm, so, yeah, I'm thinking yeah, it's you're just, taking a whole year off, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I've had slabs of time where I've not been able to do anything. I've, I've had sort of a year at, at a time, nine months at a time where I've been too sick um which is obviously not resting or taking a break but um so yes I just want to say that I have gone through periods of absolute inactivity um but uh yeah um I hope I hope that my curiosity drives me for the rest of my life I anticipate being well into my 90s and still working um but as you might know you know the I quit sugar business I shut that down in May 2018 and gave everything to charities or sort of all the funds from it anyway and um a bold move yeah well what it did um yeah I guess so I mean I I I did it because I just um I I know that I'll keep working for the rest of my life and I know that the only way that I can keep doing that is um if I am doing stuff that is sticks to my values you know and my options were to sell the business to someone who would want me to stay in the business for a couple of years, their old golden handcuffs um, to sort of, you know, do the transition. Um, And that would be highly compromising. Ditto even just selling to somebody and watching them just leverage the community and the goodwill to make money. Mm -hmm. Um, So I did what I felt was the best thing um, by kind of the concept 
you know, the idea of quitting sugar. It should never be a money-making exercise. I just didn't want to be making money out of people's, um, out of, you know, people's desire to be healthier. Mm. And, um, but the irony is, you know, it's actually brought incredible abundance because I now, I actually now pay my bills, pay my rent and, you know, so on by doing um, keynote speeches to corporates particularly banks and insurance companies and financial institutions on how to have a life of value without money. I mean, the irony is just wonderful, you know? Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, to, yes, that to me, um, that to me is how I also modulate my anxiety is by ensuring that I work to my moral compass, mm -hmm. that I, that I am not uh, compromised in that. Yeah, and really spreading like messages of from your heart, basically. It it sounds to me. Yeah, what it feels like. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. Just these questions just popped into my head about the money thing. Do you feel it's easier to kind of be more relaxed or or, or put less emphasis on money when you feel that that is a need that's always been easily met? Or like, is it really hard for people who've always struggled to have enough money to kind of see that, to take the yeah. value um, away from it in the same way and feel safe? Um, well, I'll answer that as somebody who grew up with nothing. Um, my parents had nothing. Uh, we grew up on a subsistence living property. There was a, just a block of land that dad got cheap and, um, we, you know, we went into town once a week. That's just, you know, they only had enough petrol to, for us to go into town once a week. Um, I was the kid, the only kid in my year of 220 kids who didn't go on the school excursion, didn't go on school camp. So I certainly didn't grow up um, with that reliance on money or that safety net or that sense that it would always be there. Um, and as I say, I've gone through very long periods of um, not being able to work and losing everything and being stripped back to, I mean, my mid thirties after leaving Cosmo, I was stripped of everything and ended up with just um, really two suitcases of belongings. And I had to go and find somewhere to live. I ended up living in a army shed in the forest outside Byron Bay. Um, it wasn't nearly as fashionable as it now sounds. <laughs> um, and uh, and um, I was able to live cheaply and and I lived off writing one column, you know, newspaper column a week. Um, so I've always, I suppose, my values haven't been based on money because I didn't grow up that way. And I grew up having to make do without money. And so, and I found, I realized I actually um, experienced great freedom in that. Um, but I get your point. Um, I get your point, but uh, I think I think it's sort of difficult and challenging and requires bravery, whether you've got money or you don't, whether you grew up with money or whether you've got money later in life, whatever it might be. Um, everybody's got a reason to be awkward around taking that great dive, you know, mm -hmm. into the unknown. Um, but I suppose I've always felt that I've always had this mantra. If all else fails, I'll just go back to being a waitress. Although, you know, post COVID, that's not necessarily the soundest um, career path at the moment. And a lot of yeah. waitresses and waiters are out of work, but I've also had to at various times in my life contemplate going out to um, sort of literally, now this is, you know, not living in tune with my values, but literally going out to the mines in central Australia and just, doing a six month stint to get some cash. Like mm. I'll do what it takes. And I've had, I've been in that position in, you know, sort of in my adult life many times over. Oh my gosh. What a, what a life you've led Sarah. And we haven't even got to the part where you have spent basically eight years traveling out of one or two suitcases. Yeah. Well, it ended up um, that two suitcase sort of situation. I great. I just didn't replace stuff and have gradually, gradually whittled it down to a 15 kilo backpack. Um, and that's what I lived out of for probably in the end, a year and a half, the final year and a half of that process. And I've been living in a home, an apartment with furniture for the first time uh, for about two and a half years now. Um, 
So it's reasonably recent that I've been living a, you know, so-called normal life. Although all of my furniture is secondhand, every last bit of it, um, including the pot plants, including the hall runners. They're all, you know, picked up from um, Facebook Marketplace, the side of the street, you know. So, um, yeah, I still don't rely on too much money to, to get by. Amazing. And so while you were running your business and everything, you were just, you had your computer and, and that was kind of, you just bring that with yeah. you? Yeah. 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 I've never, I mean, I write eBooks, right? I've never owned an e-reader. Like I just don't see the point. I've got a phone and I've got a laptop. Why would I get an in-between bit, you know? So, um, just to have yeah, all I've, the gadgets. I've, yeah. And I don't own a car. I haven't owned a car, gosh, for years and years and years now. Um, and uh yeah I, I ride a bike everywhere that's just what i do um and uh yeah it's just it's it's not because i mean it's just basically because it's i actually find it more freeing you know i can live with more flow with less possessions and i just yeah going to i, I write about this a fair bit in this one wild and precious life my most recent book mm -hmm. about um how going to the shops is an anxious experience and it's it's really life sapping um you know shopping begets shopping it takes half a day it um keeps you in this sort of hedonistic cycle that's unsatiating and it stops me from doing the stuff i love so i have this hashtag you know hike don't shop um and not owning a car it means i'm not caught up in all the admin i mean it's work it's work i don't want to be engaged in in this lifetime i'd prefer just to ride my bike um or catch a bus you know it's a or walk you know yeah. and of course the premise of this one wild and precious life is that i walk my way um through a three-year investigation in how to save this one wild and precious life and i literally walk around the world um and um so yeah part of the reason i don't own a car is it forces me to walk yeah so you you researching this book and writing this book you were having a, an experience you were going on on a on a physical journey yeah 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 i um it sort of that's that's sort of how i investigated the ideas um i've always hiked again to modulate my anxiety it's probably one of the best kind of secrets the secret salve you know mm. um and i go into the science as to why that works in this one wild and precious life i explore a lot of the studies um that are reasonably recent um but yeah it sort of turned out that it was my way of also handling the incredible grief and angst and frustration i was feeling um in the face of the climate crisis um yeah. and then of course COVID and all the other sort of political polarization that we're witnessing um the inequities that were just getting more and more intense um and you know i was despairing for the world and i would just literally just go and hike it out and then i realized ah oh, well this is sort of my through line for the book but it's actually also my solution it's actually my path forward like quite literally um so and then of course i you know looked into well why does it work and there's tens of thousands of studies that have been done to show the benefits of walking in nature and you know i follow in the footsteps of frederick nietzsche and virginia wolf and a bunch of poets and various people who of course had incredible anxiety and all of them walked to actually flesh out their ideas um henry miller sylvia plath um you know um charles dickens charles darwin um vincent van gogh they all walked to develop their ideas um mm. it's incredible it's in the, the the legacy is incredible that's amazing i i love how you keep tying it back to all these these amazing thinkers in the world and, and i suppose that's what a lot of that anxiety is it's just lots of thinking <laughs> and needing to yeah. needing to channel that into a a way that that feels healthy and sustainable yeah and the other way to 
put it, of course, is that to be a great thinker, you need anxiety. <laughs> you know, it goes both ways, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, when you've got, ang- you know, like it's sort of the, it, the two, it's a, the two kind of go hand in hand, you know, mm-hmm. anxiety enables great thinking once you know how to modulate it. And, and of course, walking, walking really does help with that. And that's what a lot of anxious thinkers worked out over the, over the eons. Yeah. And so what in your mind, looking at this book, the, the, this one wild and precious life, like it's, it sounds very much like a, an exploration for towards meaning in the world and what can we do about all this stuff that's going on, this despair and disconnection we all feel. Um, what, what, where do we need to be going? What in your mind defines a, a life worth living? Well, um, a big part of this book was instead of going inward, you know, with the anxious journey, which is what first we make the beast beautiful was, I, I feel that the world is calling us outwards, out to save the planet, out to save each other. And um, I think that, yeah, I think in terms of having a meaningful life, it is about being actively engaged and reconnecting with nature, reconnecting with our real nature. And I feel that a lot of the problems in the world today have stemmed from a disconnect, a disconnection from what matters and a disconnection from the natural world. And, you know, um, I say I say this at some point in the book, um, you know, when we love something, we'll save it. We'll do everything we can to save it. So if you think of those stories we hear of the 50 kilo mum who can lift a car off uh, you know her toddler you know if she's if it's been run over um those stories you know we know that they happen we don't know how they happen but when we love something so much we will do everything we can to save it and magic can happen humans are capable of incredible feats and that's what's gonna that's what it's gonna take to actually to actually um combat the climate crisis mm-hmm. and the the current political situation that we're in globally so that's where our meaning uh, seeking needs to go. It needs to be about being politically engaged. And the, the biggest danger to us right now is a seed, what I call, well, I don't call it a seedia, the ancient Greeks invented the term. It's kind of like a listless, uncaring slothfulness that comes about from just being too overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And if we allow the overwhelm of the current situation to send us into a seedia, um, that will literally kill us. It'll actually see us, um, it'll see us, you know, let the climate crisis kill us, but it'll also, it'll also just destroy us and our sense of what matters. Mm. And we, as you said, you know, as we sort of kicked off this conversation earlier, it's um, we are meaning making machines. And if we shut off from meaning, um, well, what's the point? You know, Mm. what is the point? Um, A a really dangerous type of nihilism sets in. Um, So yeah, being, being firing up, waking up, and getting all hands on deck engaged in this in this um, fight, dare I say it, to save our beautiful one wild and precious life. Mm. That is where meaning will have to come for us um, in the next, you know, 10 years, 50 years, 100 years. That's um, what we're being called to do right now. And not just sitting in anxi- anxious despair about the problems, but actually taking action because every single person listening to this, you and I, we both have the, the, we all have the opportunity to stand up for what we believe in, to take action. There's always something we can do. And I think it's the, where anxiety can kind of tug us down is into that just spiral of like, I I don't know what to do. I'm hope it's hopeless. And actually it can do. And that's the other dangerous part of the way that we discuss you know, anxiety in 2020 is as a disorder where it's a, you know, chemical imbalance in the brain, all of these misnomers, you know, it's inaccurate ways of describing it. It's actually the science has been debunked um, in and around that idea of a chemical imbalance in the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and despite the fact that many psychiatrists still use that language. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes what happens, and I think for young people, it's important for there to be a discussion around the fact that they've got a legitimate issue and it needs to be addressed. And, you know, for young people, that's a really important 
um, it's a process, but as we get older and as we become adults, um, we actually, the idea of, of sort of, I don't know, cocooning ourselves in this idea that we're, we're anxious and it's all too much. And I can't, I can't, you know, hashtag, I can't even, um, is, is actually really dangerous. It's, it's not, it's a dis- doing a disservice to our humanity and a disservice to our mental well-being um because that's not the case we are capable of it mm. and if we and sometimes that um medical diagnosis of being disordered being sick it actually prevents us from rising to our best selves mm. yeah yeah i love that so much and so the what is it that in this world where it feels like everything's just getting worse and worse, especially when we are um, consuming lots of media and the news, what is it that still gives you hope for our future? Um, well, I, I really struggled with that while I was writing the book and I hit some low points where I had to actually really focus on, on, on that exact question. Um, what gives me hope is that there is so much beauty in the world. It's the beauty of life. It is the gift of life. It's the joy of life that makes me go, there's something inherently special here and inherently special things will hang on and hang on and we will fight for them. As I say, I'm really hoping and I do have faith in humanity in this regard that we will remember how much we love life and it might take in us kind of hitting the 11th hour you know, we might have to hear like the, the almost to the last minute before I, we we're we're like, holy shit, we're about to lose this. We better really fight for it. And so, I guess I have hope because we've done this before. This is what humans are great at. It's what actually makes humanity so special. It's I use the example of a football game or a baseball game where it's the last 30 seconds and the losing team is down three points or something and and something weird happens so sort of almost like all the normal tactics are thrown out the window and um the losing side goes into what i call kamikaze mode they basically just throw everything at it you know it matters so much to them to not lose this game that they just fire up and and do something magic and you know what so much of sporting history is full of these games that we remember where you know so and so hit the home run or so and so dropped the try in literally the last half a second you know and um human human experience has been full of those kinds of stories and i think i think we'll do it again that's what we do but um we are at the we're we're in the final we're in those final 30 seconds we literally are And we kind of need to look around and go, holy shit, there's only 30 seconds left on the clock. You know, we're going to have to pull out everything. And that's where we are at right now. And we are getting all the signs. If COVID is not that signal, if the bushfires were not that signal, if the political situation in the US and the economic recession that we're all descending into is not that signal, I don't know what is. Oh my God. You, I got shivers as you were explaining that. And I, I also had this thing pop into my head of, it's almost like we've all experienced, especially the, the, with, with the anxiety around submitting something to a deadline, Sarah. And it's like, you put it off, you put it off, you put it off. And then in that last like day that it's due, you can just smash out this beautiful assignment or submit what you need to submit. And it's like superhuman brain power comes in. It's kind of the same thing. Yeah. yeah, it is. And it's actually a really good example because it's not like you don't think about it beforehand. Mm. You're ruminating on it. You're kind of stressing about it. You're putting it off because you are stressed. And that's what we're doing. For the mm. last 30 years, we've been putting off addressing this problem. You know, the extinctions, the animal extinctions have just been going up and up. The, the you know, the polar caps have been melting uh we've watched it all we've known it's happening but it's like yeah i might just leave it to the last minute but that doesn't mean we haven't been thinking about it doesn't mean we haven't been formulating those arguments for that perfect essay we might write it at the last minute but um yeah i think that's what we've been doing i think it hasn't 
I think all of the, the discussions, the overwhelm, the, you know, there's been stuff happening. Uh, we're just going to have to draw on all of it from the recesses of our consciousness and bring it forth in that final one nighter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. um, and I don't want to rest on that too much. I think the discussion, you know, we can't, we're here, we're here at that point. Um, and the great news is what also gives me hope um, is that all the solutions to the climate crisis, for instance, already exist. The technology has been invented. The mechanisms are in place. The proof is there. You know, some of them exist in the Netherlands. Some of them exist in Denmark. Some of them exist in Portugal. Um, and they're playing out and they're getting the results. And, and so it's just a matter of us. It's a bit like that. You know, we've been formulating the arguments. We've now just got to have the willpower, the political and collective consumer willpower to bring it all together in that wonderful last minute essay <laughs> yeah yeah and i think it's just about as well like we can't lose we, we can't lose hope and go into that despondency it's like we've just got to keep hoping for better for humanity because what else are we going to do yeah what else matters yeah you know yeah, oh, yeah. Sarah, yeah. Fact, I, it's a good point i've kept you too long i've got to let you go um <laughs> where can we learn more about what you're doing and where can we find your book um, well, this one, Wild and Precious Life and First We Make the Beast Beautiful are in all bookstores, at least I hope so. If it's not, ask your bookstore to restock it. Um, and it's also, you know, online and various things. You can go to my website, sarahwilson.com, and you can actually order the books that way as well. And I generally have links to stores that are offering discounts. Um, and then also I'll be doing a national tour in February and March of 2021 with Live Nation. So I'm actually touring Australia, including regional Australia and New Zealand, um, a big sort of tour to discuss these big topics, to have a massive kind of almost collective book club uh, mm -hmm. with, with the nation. So, um, yeah, and, and tickets are on sale and you can actually access them as well via my website. Oh, I'm going to go grab a ticket so I can attend and, and oh, please do, please do. I'd love to. Thank you so much, Sarah. So insightful. Thank you for your vulnerability, for sharing from the heart and just being a force for good in this world. Honestly, I just, I hope people commend you for that and and i just want to acknowledge that today you know what that's very kind and you've said it at a on a very on a day where i do need to hear something like that so thank you i appreciate it well, you're most welcome <laughs> well thank you so much Sam. if you're ready for the deep dive into this work to master your anxious mind i invite you to join the anxiety reset program over 90 days, I'll be guiding you on how to build your mental resilience, reprogram those limiting beliefs that keep you stuck in self-doubt, heal your gut, balance your hormones, nourish your mind, body, and soul. Using a combined approach of naturopathy, nutrition, hypnotherapy, and live group coaching with me, you'll feel supported and motivated to show up for yourself consistently day after day. And this is how you will experience extraordinary results. You can master your anxious mind. The best time to begin is right now. Let's do it together. You'll find the link to learn more in the show notes. Thank you for listening. We have reached the end of this episode. If you enjoy this podcast and you find it helpful, I would really appreciate it if you would hit subscribe or share this episode on your Instagram stories and make sure you tag at Georgie the naturopath. But that is all for today. Please be kind to yourselves. Know that you are enough and you are exactly where you need to be.